Welcome, everyone. Uh, we are so glad you're here. Thanks for joining us today. Um, welcome to our education program, Intermission, uh, where invited experts uh, come and talk to us about how we can be and feel a little better every day. We are super excited and honored to have uh, Dr. Russell Kennedy here with us today uh, to discuss his book, Anxiety Rx. I must be having a little anxiety right now. Uh -huh. um, and he's going to talk to us about how he healed from his own anxiety and how you can too. So Dr. Russ, thank you for being here. And You're welcome, Sam. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so excited. Um, how do you, maybe just to get started, you want to tell a little, I don't know how many people have read your book yet, um, but tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got here. Sure. Well, I mean, the short version is that uh, I grew up with a schizophrenic bipolar father. So there was a lot of chaos around the house. My my dad was never abusive or violent or anything like that, but he would lose touch with reality. And for a boy to see your dad kind of lose touch real with reality like that and do it on a regular basis really created a lot of chaos in my life. And that was the underpinnings of my anxiety. I was always I was always a sensitive kid to start with. And then, you know, if you're a sensitive kid and you have a, a difficult environment, it's kind of like sets the stage for anxiety, depression, eating disorders, OCD, all that kind of stuff. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Our, our sensitivity does matter, doesn't it? Oh yeah. It's a huge, it's actually a huge factor because I don't see anybody with really chronic anxiety who wasn't kind of born a sensitive child. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I haven't heard that yet. I can see why it's you're, we're more prone. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely a sensitive person. So, and in the industry uh, too. I mean, I think that you know storytelling, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. I think we want to be connected with ourselves, and I think it's I think it's hard sometimes, you know. And I think when if you grow up with a parent who was, you know, you you weren't matched, you didn't quite fit in with, or you felt like was abusive or violent or or troubled or whatever. I think as a sensitive person, you kind of gravitate towards connection, which is why I think we love stories and yeah. storytelling. But at the same time, we're afraid of it. Like I'm afraid of connection because of my dad. Now I've done a lot of work on it. So I'm, I'm con considerably better now than I was. But I think that's a lot of us with, with sort of chronic anxiety. Anxiety is part of life. I mean, we're always worried about, you know, money, relationships, kids, whatever. Like, but it's if it's chronic, if it's, you know, and especially in the film industry, because I was talent for a couple of things, one with A&E, one with history. I know how long the days can be. I was also one of the doctors for the film sets in Vancouver when I lived in Vancouver. Oh, so they would call me for going on set if somebody got sick or whatever. Oh, okay. And I just, you know, some of the hours that people put in and just, it's just a, it's a really stressful industry. It is. Absolutely. Yeah. And we will, I will add to that. We have a lot of movie theater employees. We assume, right. And they work long hours. They learn weekends, holidays. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, and speaking to that sensitivity part, it does draw, uh, that type of person to the industry. I sure. think so too. Yeah. yeah I think Creativity. so too. Yeah. It makes sense. Doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I do want to just say, uh, thanks for putting that in the chat. Uh, we're going to, we, we have the Q and a open, so we want to encourage everyone to throw in their questions and just want to remind you, like, I know sometimes you hesitate with asking a question, but all of us uh, have these feelings of anxiety and alarm in our bodies uh, to different degrees. So um, I imagine any question you ask, somebody is going to want to hear that uh, that answer. So, and that's usually the format that I operate best in because I was a doctor for like 22 years before I became right. like a full blown anxiety specialist. So people coming in with questions was kind of what I did 30, 40, 50 times a day. So oh, amazing. Good. So fire away. Cause I know anxiety is one of those topics for sure for a long time that I was, you know, embarrassed to bring out in my, in my field, especially as a doctor, because we're all supposed to be, you know, this, these, you know, we work 36 hours at a time. We, you know, and, and I could do all that stuff, but it always came at a cost. And I think that we, you know, in the film industry, you, you do this stuff, but there's always a cost. You know, I know my, one of my good friends is a nurse and, and he's on four days on 12 hours, four days off 12 hours. And he says the first two days, I'm just recovering. Right. right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think, I think it's interesting um, 
how much anxiety is a part of a lot of our lives. It's definitely people are talking about it in a different way. And I, yep. I know we're going to get into how you look at it with the alarm, uh, you know, kind of thinking about it as your body's trying to send you a signal or let you know something is going on or something's wrong. Um, right. So maybe do you want to you want to talk a little bit about that? Because that's such that's a newer idea. Um, I mean, I'd never read it in a book like how you laid it out. So yeah, I mean, I I I assume that that anxiety has much more to do with old unresolved wounds that are still stuck in us from childhood. And, you know, believe me, as, as trained as a medical doctor, and, and I've got a background in neuroscience, degree in neuroscience and developmental psychology, you know, it, I want to have a seizure sometimes because it just sounds so ethereal. <clears throat> and so, and it's the opposite to how I was trained. You know, I was trained that anxiety is an issue of the mind, which it certainly is. Right. But the body plays a much bigger role than most traditional therapists would have you think. Mm -hmm. So it's this old trauma that I believe that's stored in our bodies that creates the uh, worries, warnings, worst case scenarios that our mind creates. Because our mind is constantly reading the body in this process called interoception. So the mind is always reading the body and the mind is a compulsive meaning making make sense machine. So it has to make sense of this alarm feeling in the body so it does it by creating warnings what ifs worst case scenarios and then we believe those warnings what ifs worst case scenarios and that acts and creates more alarm in the body so we get in this alarm anxiety cycle and most therapies try and just fix the thoughts and mm -hmm. the analogy that i draw is it's kind of like being in a rowboat with a hole in it now it fills up with water which is kind of like your anxiety and you can bail water out of that rowboat and feel a little bit better but unless you go deeper, unless you go under and patch the hole in the boat, which is basically the old alarm, the old unresolved trauma and wounding that's still stuck in you, typically from childhood, you're always going to be at the mercy of this interoceptive process where your mind is going to make sense of that alarm feeling in your body, even if you don't feel it directly. Right. Your mind is always trying to make sense of what's going on in your body. So if your body has this alarm in it, your mind will always create these worries. And then you believe the worries mm -hmm. because you made them up for one. Mm -hmm. And the other unfortunate part of our human wiring as a neuroscientist is that when we get alarmed, we create all this cortisol and epinephrine in our system. And we actually shut off the rational part of our brain in favor of the emotional part of our brain because that's the way it was 60,000 years ago when you were in a fight or a battle, you didn't need your rational mind. You needed your emotional mind to sort of work your body for so you. Important. Yeah. So we still, yeah. So we still have these stone age brains in this digital world. So we create so much of our own anxiety and then we believe our worries because we made them up, which creates more of this alarm. And we never really actually get at the underlying root cause of the problem, which right. is this old unresolved, you know, Usually it's parental somewhere you know, with your parents or with traumas or abuse or abandonment or somewhere in your past that's created this unresolved wound that's still in you. And your mind is just trying to make sense of that wound in the best way that it possibly can, which is usually by creating worries. And then we get sidetracked into the worries when the worries aren't really the problem. It's the old alarm. Right. So, yeah. So just want to underline there. Yes, we continue to create it. And that's why awareness is so important, because without awareness, you just think, which was kind of what society tells us, if you have anxiety, you're an anxious person, right? Right. Like it's a mystery. Right. And what you're yep. saying is that there's a there. It started from somewhere. I think I had read that the, the, the similar to what you're saying about the brain. It's a pattern matching machine. Yes, absolutely. Right. So like if you had a chaotic childhood or whatever was going on, you're going to keep looking for it in the, as you, as you go through life. And yeah, if, you, cre you create it. You so create basically it, yeah. what was normal for you? And I'll use myself as an example here. So okay. chaos was kind of normal in my childhood. Mm -hmm. So my dad would be great for a while, loving, caring, intelligent, you know, really helping me with all sorts of things, riding a bike hitting a ball, all that stuff that dads are supposed to do. But then every once in a while, he would go like completely depressed or completely manic where he'd be awake for four days playing the trumpet. Frightening. 
Yeah. And, and, and it was scary for me. Mm -hmm. So basically this, this pattern of chaos and Freud called it the repetition compulsion. So what was normal for you in your childhood, you will unconsciously replicate in adulthood. So I created, when I was in my twenties and thirties, I created like a lot of relationships that were just full of chaos because that's what I was used to as a child. I saw a lot of my patients who had alcoholic parents pick alcoholic partners. So we unconsciously have this drive, like I said, Freud, Freud called it the repetition compulsion mm -hmm. to replicate what was normal in our childhood, in our adulthood. And, you know, if, if chaos was normal, that's why I actually loved when I was doing my A&E and my history and we'd be up till late and we had to watch the light and right. the, the chaos involved in the shoot was just, was energizing for me. But the problem is it comes at a cost. It yeah, comes at a, at a risk of your own health over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to get to the risk of the health and um, want to underline what you keep saying, because if you're talking about awareness, because like you started, you had to have awareness at some point, like something's really not working here. Yeah. Or maybe, I mean, there's tons of people out there and we're, we're probably a lot are listening to us, high functioning, right? Oh, yeah. Holding down jobs, relationships, every, everything, but they are feeling overwhelmed on a daily basis or repeating relationships, like you said, that aren't healthy or so it's like bringing the awareness is the first step, would you say? Of course. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like and you that's have what to I, realize something. Yeah, you have to see it and you have to be able to see it because when you can see it, you don't have to be it. That's one of my little catchphrases. When oh, you I like see that. the anxiety, <laughs> you don't have to be it because a lot of times we will get transported back. There's a place in our, our brain called the amygdala and the amygdala is involved in just about every fear response in human beings. Now, the amygdala has no sense of time. Okay. So- and it also tracks anything that's ever hurt you. So if a dog so bit you, yeah, a dog bit you when you were three, you may not, you know, you may not even remember it, but right. you have this deathly fear of dogs, right? So, so it, and the other thing about that is that when we get stressed, we go back into that same soul sort of amygdala based fear. So we turn back into a four year old who's afraid of dogs. Mm -hmm. We turn back into, uh, a nine-year-old who's afraid of people yelling because their parents used to scream at each other. So we go back, our brains remember these things and our body stores these things, especially if they're too much for us to bear. So I think that's what happens when we're, ch when we're children. There's a stress that's too much for us to bear as children. Mm -hmm. So right. it gets repressed, suppressed, whatever term you want to use into the unconscious mind. And the body is a representation of that unconscious mind. So eventually it gets offloaded into the body. And this is a very popular book. The body keeps the score. Mm -hmm. So the body keeps your old wounds. So mm -hmm. it's to, to heal from that, you first have to be aware, okay, I have these old wounds. I have this abandonment fear. I have this fear of people yelling. I have this, this vomiting fear as, as Leslie says, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of these things that, that comes up with me and it's, it's grooved. It's almost like a train track. Like every time I get stressed, I go down the same train track. Right. So it's like, here I am on this train track. Can I see that I'm on this train track? Because like I said earlier, the front part of your brain, the, the rational part of your brain gets paralyzed by stress. So it, it doesn't actually allow us to see that we're in it. We just feel that we're in it. Right. And that's what makes it so hard to treat because if you're not aware of it, if you don't know how it acts in your body, there's really not a whole lot you can do about it. You can change your thoughts for sure, but that, that's like pushing a rock up a hill all the exactly. time. It's so much work to try yeah. and change your thoughts all the time. Well, also like, and do correct me if I'm wrong here, but right, the I had read that the amygdala is set, well, at some point something happens where it says we're in danger. And it actually sends chemicals to the prefrontal to kind of shut it down where, yeah. right? So, and the prefrontal, and this is what I tell some of my clients, that's your thinking, dreaming, planning. Right. So if you're not able to do those three things, that's a clue. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's a clue right there. Like if you can't think, dream, or plan, that's a clue that something's going on. Because I was thinking about awareness, like it can take some of us so long to have the awareness of like, my life's not working or I'm overwhelmed all the time or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And the clues help to go like, well, wait a minute, that, because <laughs> you physically can't do it. So yeah. you try to change your thoughts, but if you're unable to like, your body's saying, nope, we are, we are in uh, stressville. We are in danger. We cannot, uh, we cannot think ahead. 
it's going to be really hard. But a lot of us stress kids use that alarm energy as For fuel, sure. right? It's the high but function. eventually, yeah. eventually, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, couple of divorces, you know, that kind of stuff, it catches up with you. Yeah. Right. And that's the thing. And that's when, you know, we start getting into, you know, more significant things like depression, not not minimizing anxiety, how painful anxiety can be. But there is a point where the body just says, I won't do this anymore. Right. And you collapse. And hopefully you have enough awareness to see that's happening and you get some help. Because that's the other thing is people don't want to get help. You know, there was a huge stigma around anxiety, depression, eating disorders, uh, personality disorders, all this kind of stuff. So people go through this little cycle where it's like, I'm feeling so terrible. I've got to go see my doctor. I got to get a medication. I've got to do something about this. And then they have a couple of good days and they think, oh, maybe I'm okay. And then, you know, two days later, it's like, I got to do something about this. This is terrible. I can't live like this. And then they have a couple of days where they feel okay. So it just like, it goes on like this sometimes for months before people used to come years. in and see me, or years before yeah. they come in and say, look, you yeah. know, I've got, I've been in this cycle now for five, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. I got to do something about it. Yeah. And as you say, awareness is the first step because once you become aware of it, you start engaging this prefrontal cortex. You start engaging your rational ability and you start saying, what do I need that's good for me? I know this pattern has sort of served me in a way, in sort of this childhood way, but it's not serving me anymore. My relationships are crumbling. I don't, my friendships are crumbling. And usually I see it be when they get into their thirties and sometimes their forties, they start withdrawing. Mm -hmm. They start withdrawing from their friends. And, and the last thing to go is their work. And doctors are brutal for this, but it's also true in high demand industries too. So oh, the last thing to go is their work. So the work is maintained, but mm -hmm. everything around them starts to crumble. Relationships, everything. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. that's where addictions, I don't mean to keep cutting in, but that's no, when addictions come in, you know, yeah. alcohol, drugs, whatever, you know, that's when addictions come in because the addictions are there to kind of try and ease. I mean, just to cut to the chase, the addictions are there to ease the pain of childhood. That's absolutely. really why we're addicted. Absolutely. Coping strategy. Yeah. It's a coping strategy, which is another clue. Like yes. if you are doing these things, what are you trying to avoid? Like what's, what's stopping you from living the life or not drinking every night or not drugging or whatever you're doing or shopping or Netflixing or like, I like to or throw porn, them off. You know, yes. like there's so many distractions out there. So like we, we live in this dopamine driven immediate gratification world, right? And, and that's why there's no board. And that's why our kids are suffering so much with anxiety, because when we were young, if you were bored, you were freaking bored. There was nothing you could do about it, right? You had to deal with it on some level. Right. But now, you know, or if you ha were going through a breakup, you know, there was, you had to deal with it. Now people get just locked into their phones. So they're constantly distracted away from the underlying cause but the underlying cause doesn't go away. In fact, it just festers. It gets worse and worse. And then we go deeper into addiction. We go deeper into work, yes. that kind of thing. It's so important. I just want to underline what you're saying because um, people might have noticed that in younger people, or maybe they could deal with something when they were younger. And now that there's, there are more distractions now. Yep. And that is part of, I mean, it is another coping strategy. It's taking you away from sitting with whatever's happening. Because it's hard to sit with what's happening. I mean, I think it's hard. The way I describe it too is the child in you holds this pain, mm -hmm. and the adult in you doesn't want to go back and visit that child because the child holds all the pain. Right. So, and the child feels abandoned by the adult part of you because it's like, here I am with my hands up. Please help me. Please help me. And the adult either doesn't know they're there or knows they're there and just like, no, I, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with you. And that, that causes this split in us from the adult self and the child self and the mind and the body. So we live up in our heads and we never really, this is when people, people who are afraid of death, you know, I often say, well, you're not really afraid of dying. You're really afraid of living. You're really mm -hmm. afraid of connecting with the world because that it could get taken away from you. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's realizing that things do get taken away from you. It's mm -hmm. just part of life. And as, as a child, if that was just abhorrent, if that was just something that was so exceedingly painful, you couldn't deal with it, then you never really learn the skill of resilience of being able to, yes, this hurts, but I can sit with it. I can stay with it. And once you gain the confidence of being able to stay with your pain, it doesn't hold the same um, you know, gauge over you anymore. It doesn't rule your life anymore.
Yeah, I want to add to that, like you had said, like as a child, if you couldn't, and if your if your parents couldn't sit with you, and couldn't yeah. acknowledge, or your caregivers, like, and say, hey, you're you look sad today, what's going on? And yeah. so a lot of people, I don't know about if you've seen this, but I'll talk to a lot of people who are like, my childhood was good. Yeah. But when you talk to them about like who was with you when you were sad, who noticed when you were upset, yeah. sometimes that is that emotional neglect is, I, I think, a big. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and and no one to tell. You know that was the other right. thing too. Like kids who I often see were bullied, and I was bullied myself. You know, I'm embarrassed to tell my parents that I was bullied. You know, so that's the other thing. So not only do you not have anyone to tell, it's like you hold it yourself. You know, and, and, and childhood is such a, you know, I want to go into Dr. Evil. You know, my childhood was typical. Summers in Rangoon, luge lessons. In the spring, we'd make meat helmets. You know, it's just, <laughs> yeah. and, and really looking at your childhood, like what, what was the familiar pattern for you? Was it abandonment? How do, you, how do you replicate that abandonment? How do you pick partners that are going to abandon you? Like what was normal for you in childhood? Because like Conrad Lorenz and the Ducks, you know, those old experiments where um, Conrad Lorenz was this guy who, you know, he he became the mother figure for these ducks and they followed him everywhere. Everywhere. We we imprint on this. So we imprint our childhoods uh, and and the factors involved in our childhoods and we replicate those factors over and over again. And unless we're aware of it. We can't change it. And then we just create all this alarm in our system because the adult self and the child self splits farther and farther and farther as we get older and older and older. And then that creates this tremendous amount of alarm in our system that the mind takes and then it starts making up stories. And it's really, it's not the mind. The mind is just a passive reflector of this old trauma that's still locked in your body. Now, not everything is trauma. Absolutely. But- Every, every, everybody I see, you know, as, as an anxiety specialist is trauma. Like mm-hmm. I don't see anybody who had like a brilliant childhood and all that kind of thing and comes in to see me with chronic anxiety and worry. And again, anxiety right. is part of life. It really is, you know, but, but chronic anxiety, waking up every day or, you know, getting it every night when you, when the sun goes down, like that's not normal. Right. Right. There was something you were, t- yeah. Oh, I think this is, I think a big hurdle in our culture is recognizing that the childhood wasn't perfect. I don't know about in your family, you know, yeah. like in my family, that's, there's a, there's a sense, I grew up in the Midwest of like, let's get over it. Right. It's time to move on. Yeah. And that really, um, that impacted me for a long time. I kept thinking there was something wrong with me, which took me a while to figure out about shame. Like, oh, oh. that's what that is. Uh, nobody's talking about that, but, but yeah, this idea of like, it's over. So get over it. And yeah when you were just what you were talking about, I just want to like for everyone listening, because if this is a hard, I think this is a real hard one for people to be like, I should be over it. It was so long ago. My parents did so much for me. So right. maybe if you, I don't know if you want to say a little bit about that. I can. Sure. I mean, I think what happens to us when we're kids is we, we idolize our parents, even if they were, even if they're abusive, you know, there's Absolutely. this great saying that say, if you abuse, neglect, or abandon a child, the child doesn't stop loving the parent, they stop loving themselves, it, right? And that that's is, the that jabs is. that you and I have talked about before, right? Self-judgment, yeah. abandonment, blame, and shame. And I think what happens when we're kids is that, you know, say dad's an alcoholic or whatever, we learn to just push that off to the side. It's like, well, yeah, he does this, but whatever. And then when I ask people how their childhood was, they say, oh, it was good. It was good. You know, my parents are still together or whatever. And then I find out that they're, you know, it's like, well, your dad was an abusive alcoholic that actually used to beat you. It's like, that's Mm -hmm. trauma. That's not a normal childhood. But I think what happens is as children, we get so used to denying that to ourselves when we're younger, because Mm -hmm. we have to survive, that it just becomes such a way of life that we deny it throughout our whole lives. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it kind of like like marionettes, it, it runs us behind the scenes. Yep. And it also, it's a childhood story because you can almost hear it sometimes. Like I was a really bad kid. Right. Or I, I couldn't sit still. Um, You know, I I didn't, I always got in trouble at home, which are all indicators that something's going on. Like usually it's something like, but, but even as an adult, the child is taking the blame, which is what you, what you, that quote you said was like, the child doesn't, 
say, hey, my parents are something's wrong with them. It's like, no, something's wrong with me, which is. Well, we can't. We can't no. because our parents, we look at our parents as for our survival. Right. So these these two people or, you know, one person or whatever, these are the people that we need for our survival. So they, mm -hmm. we can't see them as wrong in any way. No. And it's really not until our kind of mid 20s, we start seeing our parents as real people. Mm hmm. You know, there is, and I think that's, I think that's ingrained in us as human beings to just worship your parents. And then when you start seeing them like falter or fail, and this is what I see with um, when kids tell me like as adults, they say, well, dad had an affair, you know, when I was like eight or 10 years old, it's really shocks them because they, they had this ideal of what their parents were. And mm -hmm. then they go completely against that ideal. And that creates a tremendous amount of upheaval and alarm in their system. Right. Which gets carried forward. Yeah. Unless it's resolved. Unless you have someone to tell, like you were saying, unless you have someone to, to talk to and process. And it's a great question. You know, one of the questions that I often ask people is, um, if I could give you a magic wand and you could change one thing, but only one thing about your childhood, what would it be? That's a good so, way. For me, it would be, I, I, my dad wouldn't be a men, have mental illness. I mean, our family wasn't perfect by any means at all, but that was the big one. Of you know, course. that was the one that really sort of steered the whole family. We were always fixated on what was going to happen with him. And I see that with alcoholic parents too. You know, they, they, they'll say, I wish my mother wasn't an alcoholic, you know, that kind of thing, because it does pervade every part of your childhood. So that's a good uh, tip for folks watching too. Like if they're having trouble with this conversation so far, like, oh no, I had it, my childhood was okay. You, that magic wand might help them to pinpoint something that was painful or that maybe could have gone a different way for them if, if it would have changed, right? Yeah, I think it brings things into the conscious like prefrontal area of the brain. It's like, okay, well, what could I have changed mm -hmm. as opposed to just the unconscious part, which is just bury, 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 you know, just don't, mm -hmm. don't bring it up, don't acknowledge it or whatever. And some people can go their whole lives and and do that. And and usually those people aren't that sensitive in in general. They just bury, bury, bury stuff. Or, or they wind up, not. yeah, okay. or they wind up getting physical stuff, you know, heart right. attacks. Yeah. Um, you know, people that, that get rheumatoid arthritis in their 40s as opposed to their 70s. You know, there's the body is a, re a representation of the unconscious mind. So if your body, if your mind has all this crap in it, your body will show it. And it will. And the other thing that it'll show too, is if you're at odds with your parents, you'll start showing up with chronic illness too, which mm -hmm. is not to say that you have to make friends with your parents or see them in this beautiful light or whatever, but just acknowledging maybe, and I do this with a lot of people is uh, what was a good thing about your alcoholic father, you know, or what was, what was a good thing about your narcissistic mother mm -hmm. and just focusing on that. It's not to whitewash it or whatever, it's for you because if you have a negative sort of one dimensional, and I just did a podcast on this, my own podcast, mm -hmm. the anxiety arc pod about how we tend to think of our parents in this sort of one or two sentence, one dimensional way, because our brains want to make sense of it. And often we paint our parents in a very negative light. There's not a whole lot of positive in there. And when we do that, we separate from our own existence. And when we do that, we kind of invite mental, physical, emotional dysregulation or illness. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying if your mother was horrible to you that you had to, you know, love her or whatever, but just try and find something because that's for you. That will help you uh, connect with, you know, your ancestors and that kind of thing. And there's a tremendous amount of energy that gets put into um, put, keeping your parents at length. You know, my mom could be very you know, there's always a hand under the table. She's very kind and loving, but there's always like, if I want something from you, you better do it, right? So it's like just trying to look at them as people who were traumatized themselves most of the time. And and I think that's a lot of it. But I do, you know, agree that there's a lot of people that had just horrible parents, but mm -hmm. it's really important for you as a person, especially if you're struggling with anxiety, depression, whatever, is to try and make amends even in your own mind find something about each parent that you can hold on to. And Mark Willin, who wrote this great book called It Didn't Start With You about inherited family That's trauma. A good book. Yeah, yeah. Great one. He, he has this thing, like I've been to about six of his seminars and, and he has this thing where he says, you know, if, if your parent was only 2% loving, right? 
just put your cup under that 2% and fill your cup up 100% with that 2%, which I always found was a great little metaphor and that kind of thing too, because it doesn't, it only hurts us to keep our parents at length. I'm not saying you have to be in contact with your parent or whatever, they're abusive or whatever, but in your own mind, you know, having something about your parent that you can kind of hold on to. So you're not negating them, which is basically negating your own existence, which is alarming, which causes illness as you get older. Well, it also might help with awareness. So like if there's a black and white thinking of yeah. my parents were terrible, there's a lot of work that can be done in there. There's, you, you know, you're allowed to feel the anger and the grief and all of that. And that might help with the, um, the all or nothing, like to mm -hmm. like, to, to kind of look at it like, okay, this is what happened, but there was also this. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, but it's hard though, because a lot of times like, again, that the mind is a, a meaning making machine. Absolutely. So if overall, you know, cause my narrative of my father for a long time was he was crazy, right? Cause mm -hmm. he, he was crazy. So it was one of those things that, that that was my kind of one sentence narrative. But I also negated the fact that he was a great teacher and he was really super smart and he did, he was very silly and loving and, you know, very playful as well. So I brought that in there as well. So even though there was a horrendous amount of damage that he did to our family with his illness, and, and it's more his illness than himself, I'm able to see the more positive parts of him now. And I'm more of a, at peace with him now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, th and this kind of talks about the awareness, like your, you, your awareness about your father and the relationship you had was, is more nuanced now, maybe than when you were. Oh yeah, 30. absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. And awareness is such a big piece of kind of healing anxiety or reducing it because you really have to be aware that it's there. Yeah. If you're not aware, you're, you're on autopilot. With well, it'll just, yeah, it'll run your life and you won't know why. You know, you just, you will just feel like your life is being run by some outside force. It's like that Carl Jung saying, you know, until you make the conscious, the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you'll call it fate. So a lot of what I talk about, you know, to make it as practical, practical as I can is instead of when you're feeling anxious, you know, I don't really like the term anxiety that much. Um, I prefer the term alarm because a mm -hmm. lot of people don't know what anxiety even means, right? So if you're out for lunch with someone and you say, I'm feeling anxious, they've never been anxious. They don't have a clue. But if you say I'm feeling alarmed, everyone's been alarmed. They can kind of relate to it. I so like my, that change you're making there yeah. I like it a lot. Yeah. It makes more sense. And you're right. Cause then somebody can say, Oh, what are you alarmed about? We don't often say, I guess we might say, what are you anxious about? But we kind of take it as a, Oh, it's just anxiety. There's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, and I think intuitively that, and I, I think that's been the story because the worst part of anxiety and everyone tells me this and I experienced it firsthand was you never know when it's going to end. Right. Like people can handle just about every, anything if they know it's going to end. But the worst part of anxiety is it feels like it's going to go on forever. And in neuroscience, we have this, this term called the recency bias, which is basically what your brain does to you. It says to you how you're feeling now is how you're going to feel forever. And this is the basis of suicide too, because when people Absolutely. get horribly depressed, Absolutely. they think there is no way I can feel any different than this. And it's another kind of fault or whatever you want to call it in our wiring is that when we go through a breakup, when we go through difficult times, we assume that the rest of our lives are going to be like that. And mm -hmm. that's why I love the, I love the saying, I remember reading it on Instagram somewhere or whatever. It's like some of the best days of your life haven't even happened yet. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and that when I work with teenagers, I kind of say that because they do get into this recency bias, especially if they're going through a breakup or whatever that they think my whole life is ruined. Like I'm never going to get out of this. Right. And this is a piece you talk about. It, you, it's going ahead a little bit about community and connection because that was, I was just thinking about that. Like we have to have people teaching us this so that we can go, Oh, um, you know, like if I was telling you or somebody else about a breakup or something and you were able to say, well, you know, this is really sad, but let's have the, here's the perspective that things are going to get better, right? right? So we have elders and community and people around us doing that. It's almost like a anti-alarm. Yeah. You know, like it, it, it's helping us because it's saying, okay, that's right. You've been through this and you've been through this. Because I was just thinking about that recency bias. I hadn't heard that before, but like how 
if we're not given this information, that's why mm-hmm. this information is so important. I'm so glad you're here today because yeah. if we don't have it, then, you know, it takes a while. No man's land. Yeah. We're in no man's land. Yeah. We're all alone, which creates more shame. I mean, there's just so much that the information is so important. And it cycles on itself. And that's the worst part mm-hmm. of anxiety and alarm is that we don't know that the, the thoughts are actually making it worse because our brain tells us that, that our thoughts have the answer when our thoughts just have more of the problem because basically anxiety is a problem of rumination and overthinking. So how is more thinking going to help that? You know, it's basically, that's what I tell people when you're feeling anxious, this is where I was going with that. When you're feeling anxious, look into your body rather than your mind, because your mind doesn't have the answer. Yeah. You know, they're look into your body because your body is really, because so I get what I do with people when I work with them one-on-one is I get them to find their anxiety in their body. In me, it's in my solar plexus. And some people it's in their, in their heart area. Some people it's in their throat. Like if you had um, a parent or a mother that you couldn't express yourself to, a lot of women that I talk to have the alarm in their throat. It's like a like a tennis ball, heavy, um, it's hard, it's it's yeah. hot, it's, you know, it's dark, you know, this kind of thing. And then I just really drill down into the bodily sensations of that because again, the body keeps the score. There's a there's a part of our brain called the insula that's deep, deep, deep inside of our brain that kind of mediates the top down and bottom up, sort of mediates the the conscious mind affecting the body and the body affecting the conscious mind. The insula is kind of like the way station of that. Okay. And I, I do believe that the body makes an imprint of that stress. So if you're seven years old and your parents are getting divorced, your body, that insula makes sense of that in your body. It holds that energy in your body. And for like, for me, it's in my solar plexus. Like I said, some people it's in their heart, some people it's in their throat, but we can use that area as an effigy of your younger self. So if you find your alarm, like Mm -hmm. in your chest, like that's why I say, when you feel anxious, look into your body, like, where do I feel this? You know, is it in my heart? Is it in my, my belly and my throat? Where do I feel this? Mm -hmm. And focus on it, really focus on your body. It's a much better use of your time and energy than going into your thoughts because your worries will never end and they will never solve anything. And this is so important what you're saying. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I know because, you know, so people are listening and they, people come in and out, but I'm, I want them to really hear that part because even just what you were saying, focus on the, focus on where it is, focus on how it feels. That is so much more thoughtful than what we're taught to do about anxiety. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Think differently, you know, mm -hmm. manifest the secret, all this kind of stuff. And there's nothing wrong with thinking positively. There isn't. It's just, it's going to help you cope, but it won't actually help you heal. You know, the underlying issue is there is this alarm in your body, which essentially is your younger self. Mm -hmm. It's asking for your attention. That's why it's alarming you. That's why people say anxiety is a message. It is. Mm -hmm. So it's like, can you find that in your body? And the reason I found this is because I, in 10 years ago, when I was just almost suicidal with where I was suicidal with, with anxiety Mm -hmm. is a friend of mine took me on this trip with psychedelics and in the, on the psychedelic journey, it showed me that, Hey, you know what, what you think of your alarm in your mind is actually the state or the anxiety of your mind is actually this alarm state in your body. Amazing. If you can start dealing with that. And that's why I wrote the book. That's why I wrote the program. Mm -hmm. I have a program out now. Um, mind body program for anxiety. I saw so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Great, and I, in, in uh, a month. Great, yeah. Great price point too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank well, you that, for that. That was my goal was, yeah, was, you that know, was incredible. Because people can't afford $150 an hour because when you go into therapy, it's not like you're going to do three sessions, you know, right. and it's going to be 20, 30, 40, 50 sessions typically. And well, at yeah. $150, it's crazy. So mm-hmm. I, I have a real issue with the business of trauma, you know, mm-hmm. people selling people three, four, five thousand dollar programs right. to help them with anxiety. Um, because it's just I think it's I want to get my work out to as many people as possible. So yeah, obviously, I, obviously. I, that's so, obvious. Thank you. So I'm yeah, I make it a hundred dollars and that's what that's what, it's not ninety seven dollars, it's not whatever. And if you want to pay in installments, it's two installments of fifty dollars or thirty that. like there's no, I'm not making a profit off this directly from people because I have an issue with the business of trauma, but I want 
my work to get out there. And in less than a month, there's 900 people in that program already. I believe it. I believe it. And one thing I would tell anyone who's thinking about it is that you will save your money. Let's say you're going to take do therapy. You, you're you're going to do it. You'll yep. save yourself hundreds of dollars because if you thousands, go probably. Know, thousands, if you go in knowing this, you can skip all the time it would take in these hour long sessions because it is it is so key to know the, this information. And you can also, you know, start working it for yourself to mm -hmm. rather than depending on a therapist to help you now there if you've had really significant physical emotional you know sexual trauma you're you're going to need someone to help you with that mm -hmm. like that's not something we can fix on our own but at least the understanding of what the actual root cause of the anxiety is is so critical because if we're just trying to fix the thoughts we're just bailing water out of that rowboat and we're never really you know people come to me and they've been in therapy 5 10 15 20 years yeah and they're not a whole lot better no right so I think it's really important to understand that that it, anxiety has more to do with your body than your mind. So start looking for it in your body, and then when you feel when you find it, you know, like if it's in your chest, your heart, you know, put your hand over it. I mean, I'm shortening this considerably, but put your hand over it, breathe into it, allow it to be there because it is your younger self asking for your attention. And if you could see it as your younger self and be compassionate towards it and give it, send it some love and connection you're going to start metabolizing that alarm at its source instead yeah. of just trying to fix your mind. Cause you, you, you'll never, it's like me saying, try Sam, don't think of a pink elephant. Like you can't <laughs> fix your thoughts. You can't okay. just Impossible. all of a sudden just guide your thoughts right. into a framework. You will think exactly how your body feels. Right. So change your body to heal your mind as opposed to trying to change your mind to heal your body. It's much more effective to change your body first, find that child in you, find that alarm, and, and just, you know, see it, hear it, love it and protect it. Like show that child that you're going to be there for them in a way that they didn't have when they were a child. Right. And, and I think that piece about the reason, I mean, one of the reasons why you can think of it as a child, there's lots of reasons why, but yep. if you're struggling, it's hard, it's harder to be mean and cruel sure. to a child, right? Sure. We are so a lot of people who carry shame, have anxiety, had traumatic childhoods, there's a lot of self-criticism and just, you know, being hard on the self. Jabs. Jab yeah. Exactly. Back to the yeah. past. Judgments. Yeah. What is it? Judgments? Abandonment, blame, Abandonment, and shame. Blame and so shame. that's what we do when we're children. You know, we can't blame our parents mm -hmm. for the crap that's going on in our household. So what we do, you know, the child doesn't stop blaming the parent. They start blaming themselves. And then that starts a program. Some people call it the inner critic, which isn't a bad name. Um, of self-judgment, self-abandonment, self-blame, and self-shame. And then that causes a tremendous amount of alarm in our system. So when we judge, abandon, blame, and shame ourselves, we just create more of the problem. But we think we're actually doing something, but we're not. We're just we're making sense of it, which is basically mm -hmm. what the mind does, is it makes sense of this pain, but it makes sense of it at a huge cost to our emotion. And it's it's addictive, you know. The definition of addiction yeah. is doing something that it provides. In instantaneous relief, but long-term pain. Now, if you look at the mesolimbic dopamine system, I don't want to get too technical, but but yeah. if you look at the dopamine system in the brain, when we start making the uncertain a little more certain, we secrete dopamine in our brain, which says, hey, this feels good. We're on the right track. So if you think, oh, I've got this pain in my stomach, and it's like, I don't know what it is. What could it be? And then you think, well, maybe it's cancer. Well, initially <laughs> in your brain, that will go ding, 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 ding. Okay, good because we have an answer right. but then you think oh jesus i've got cancer right and then it just circ and it cycles on itself yeah. so that's the thing about worry worry is addictive it's a form of addiction and mm -hmm. it's learning there there is a positive hit that we get from worry so it's learning to sort of move the positive hit to more long term sustainable hit which is connecting with that younger version of yourself finding the alarm in your body which is basically what the program does is it there's two meditations in there one is find your alarm, where I sort of put you into a meditative state. Uh, we talk about what you worry about or one of your traumas, and then we find it in your body. And then the next one is a yoga nidra. So it, it basically takes you into this place where your adult self can bond with your child self and your mind can connect with your body, which is one of the reasons why you have anxiety is because your mind and body are split and your adult and your child are split. 
So I don't know if there's some some questions that that yeah. people want to ask me. I, I I know that I I you know some people say it's like I'm a fire hose, like I give you so much information and it's hard to digest and it's fine. And you know you'll wake up in the middle of the night going, oh, that's what he means. That's okay. What he so right. so if you want to ask a question, by all means, I love doing that. I can start with Leslie's question here. You, if you want to go want. ahead? Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Sure. Cyclic vomiting syndrome. So it's that it's a, a syndrome where you get such uh, nausea and such a rush from your autonomic nervous system. So your autonomic nervous system has two wings in it. it, has the sympathetic, which people call the fight or flight or the gas or the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest, which is the break. Now I believe in trauma when we're younger, we activate both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic at the same time. Mm -hmm. The way the autonomic nervous system is supposed to work is when the fight or flight comes up, the relaxation goes down. And when the relaxation goes up, the fight or flight goes down. That's the, it's supposed to be a teeter totter. It's supposed to work like that. Now in kids with trauma, I believe that both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic rather than being on when the other's off are both on at the same time. Hmm. So what happens is that the gut gets two different signals. It gets a signal oh. to shut off and it gets a signal to, to activate at the same time. Same right. with muscles, same with fibromyalgia. This is the, this is basically the cause of irritable bowel syndrome as well. So the parasympathetic wow. tells the bowel to, to, to relax. The sympathetic tells, or no, the opposite. Parasympathetic tells it to, to activate and move food through. The sympathetic tells it to stop. So you get these conflicting things. So in acute situations, basically the parasympathetic has shut one part of the bowel off. The sympathetic has fired it down. It's trying to push it down. So instead of the only place it can go is back up. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I believe cyclic vomiting syndrome is. So it's, it's basically a co-activation, which is a reminder of your trauma. Um, and the thing that I would say that to sort of counteract that is if you can get into some sort of play, something that causes play, because play oh, is one God. of those other rare things that activates parasympathetic and sympathetic at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, but it's also a positive thing. So if you can play with something, you can activate, you can co-activate sympathetic and parasympathetic, and you can cause, you can cause a, um, a positive reinforcing cycle rather than a negative one. So that's what I think causes cyclic vomiting syndrome is a, a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system, which is usually from stress. And it's another way the body is just saying, I can't do this anymore. Right. So I yeah. hope that answers your question, Leslie. Thank you. That's good. Um, how... Can you talk a little bit about your ABCs? I sure. mean, we've kind of been peppering them in, but they're so good. So, yeah. I mean, I just want everyone to hear those. Yeah, sure. So it's a little acronym because I, I really want to make my work as practical as possible. So when you feel anxious, alarmed, as I like to call it, alarmed, right? awareness, like, okay, what goes on in me when I, when I'm alarmed? when I'm alarmed. Okay. Well, I get this nausea, you know, I get this tightness in my throat. Okay. You know, be aware of that. Be aware of what the early signs are. And then instead of going into your head, you go into your body and your breath. That's what B stands for. So A is awareness. This is, this is how anxiety alarm shows up in me. Mm -hmm. B is body and breath. How does it, how can I connect with my body? How to breathe, you know, yeah, um, sm smell yeah. an essential oil, um, you know, touch, Touch is one of those underrated things. And I, I think one of the reasons why our kids have so much anxiety right now is they're not getting enough touch mm -hmm. from their parents, you know, from, from everyone. Of course, there's a huge stigma on that too. Right. And then the last C is for compassionate connection to the child. So there's a lot of C's in there. Mm -hmm. So it's like finding that alarm, which is your younger self. For me, it's in my solar plexus. Finding that child in you and then compassionately connecting to them. And you can do things like um, one of the things I, I, I use with people is this thing I call commiserating. So mm -hmm. for me, it's like I talk to my younger self and I say, you know, it must have been really hard for you to see your dad start to go off into psychosis. And I just see if, you know, he has anything to say back to me. You know, it's like it must have been really difficult for you. You know, I understand, you know, what it would be like to be bullied, mm -hmm. you know, like I'm here for you now. I will see you, hear you, protect you and love you. There's there's no way we can be split because a lot of times that child, we don't even know that child is in us, right? Mm -hmm. We have oh, a sense, yeah. we have a sense, but we don't really know that that child is still living in us. So when we show that child that they're seen, heard, protected, and loved, then they can start getting now what they didn't get back then. And then we can actually start healing the root cause of the problem. 
as opposed to, again, just trying to change your thoughts. And, and insights into your past are great. You know, if you've been abused, neg neglected, abandoned, whatever, insights are great, but they won't heal you. You know, what will heal you is that ABC awareness, go into your body, go into your breath, and then have that compassionate connection to the child. Now, I'm, of course, speeding this up considerably. Absolutely. You know, I, 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 I stretch gonna... it out in the book a lot more. But that's basically, you know, that's basically the, the blueprint to mm -hmm. healing is just finding that child, finding the alarm in your body. You know, the body keeps the score. It is really important to understand that that alarm energy that you have in you is a really great beacon. It's a really great signal that you can use to start healing. So it's not your end. So important. That's yeah. right. That That's such an important clue. I think that a lot of people are starting to get and talking about now, like it's not something for you to hate or try to change or whatever. It's for you to notice like, oh, it's trying to get my attention or I need to focus on something in my life. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to talk, we do have a question that came in and then I'll ask because I want to talk about roadblocks to compassion. Okay. I feel like compassion is a tricky one, but sure. uh, Janet asked, what causes you to pass out when your anxiety gets too overwhelming? Okay. So again, there's that sympathetic fight or flight, and then there's the parasympathetic rest and digest. So your parasympathetic system runs through this nerve, mostly through this nerve called the vagus, which is the 10th cradial nerve, which enervates the heart. So basically what happens is it's kind of like when an animal gets cornered, like if a mouse gets cornered by a cat and there's no escape, it will actually shut down its nervous system. So it shuts its blood pressure down as low as it can. It shuts its heart rate down as low as it can. And it feigns death because that's the only way, sometimes the cat or the predator will see it as dead. And it's like, well, if it's dead, I don't want to eat it because that could be that could be trouble, right? So that's the only thing that the, the, the animal can do at that particular point. And we humans have that same reflex in us. So mm -hmm. when we get really, really afraid, we get high, high, high fight or flight, and then automatically we just go completely, we hit the brake as hard as we can. And then that, what that does is it shuts off our blood pressure, which we lose blood flow to our brain. When we lose blood flow to our brain, we pass out. We, and then we fall down on the ground. We get level again. That's why we pass out when we, when we uh, because the blood then can flow back into the head again. That's ah. the reason. So when people pass out, it's like, I, I remember George huh. uh, Bush years ago passed out in Tokyo and they're trying to hold him up. It's like, no, get no. his head down. Get it. That's he's not getting enough blood to his head. Like don't hold him up. Wow. So that's, that's the reason Jana is that, is that we go into this um, hyper parasympathetic activity, which is very similar to a cornered animal. They will shut off their nervous system. They shut off their blood pressure. They shut off their heart rate. Uh, you lose blood flow up into your head and that's what causes you to pass out. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Appreciate the questions. Yeah, you thanks, all can keep throwing them in there if you have them. Um, You're welcome, Janet. Yeah. Um, roadblocks to compassion, because that can be hard, right? Yeah, I mean, like tips for yeah. us there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're in this immediate gratification, you know, buck up kind of thing. And our parents did get that sort of like, there's no you know, there's no real understanding. And I think we're going the other way now with people is like, we're being a little too understanding. I think, I think there's a real balance between maintaining that kind of sympathetic tone, that kind of stuff that keeps you alive, that life force energy, and the ability to be kind to yourself mm -hmm. as well. Um, because a lot of us, when we, when we do have that split, when we're younger, from ourselves, when something's going wrong in our household, we blame ourselves. And that starts the jabs, you know, judgment, abandonment, blame, it starts that inner critic. And the inner critic kind of makes sense of how we feel. So if we feel negatively, of course, we're going to look at our legs and go, you know, I was reading a book about this woman who has, you know, issues with her body and stuff like that. It's like, I hate my legs. And it's like, my husband loves my legs, and I hate my legs. And it's like, we, we, we make sense of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that mind is a, a meaning making makes sense machine. So it will find something it doesn't like because you feel bad. Mm -hmm. So your, your brain's natural impulse when you feel bad is to look for things in your environment that make you feel bad, mm -hmm. which of course reinforces the alarm and you get caught in that whole cycle again. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to be compassionate because our body is feeling alarmed and we shut off 
the actual connection part of our brains and our bodies when we're in alarm. Right. So there's this part of us called the social engagement system. I know we only have a few minutes left, but mm -hmm. um, it's eye contact, tone of voice, prosody of voice, body language, and facial expression. So it's you and I right now, like we're connecting. Like you, when you and I talk, we connect, you know, we laugh, we have a good time, that kind of thing. That's the social engagement system in action. Okay. But if you're alarmed, evolution shuts off that social engagement system so, so we don't now. we don't want to make eye contact we don't want to connect because we don't have the software online that would allow us to connect and this is where social anxiety comes in yeah. so if you don't have the software online if you can't make eye contact with someone and feel comfortable you're not going to want to go into a party so how we do that is we do some breath exercises we put our hand on our chest we connect with ourselves we're compassionate with ourselves even though we feel negative and that's the, and, and, and it's, it's really, that's where the awareness comes in. And we start teaching ourselves that we have to find when we feel anxious early, like what, what's the early warning sign that I'm starting to go into this. And then that's when you start really applying the touch, maybe in a sense, smell an essential oil, um, go into some breathing stuff, like really regulate your body. Cause when you regulate your body, your social engagement system comes back online and then you can connect. And then when you can connect, you just feel so much more loving and connected towards other people, which creates a right. loving and connection towards yourself. But if you're feeling isolated, it's very difficult to become compassionate towards yourself because you don't have the software that's online that would actually <coughs> feel kindly towards anybody, let alone yourself. Right. So it's really important to understand that you fix your body first mm -hmm. and then the compassion co comes in. You can stay compassionate things to yourself when you're alarmed, but it's really about going into your body and regulating your body and your breath and connecting with yourself first. And essential oils are wonderful in that regard because essential oil is the only smell is the only sense that actually goes directly into the emotional part of our brain. Every other sense is, is moderated by this, this nucleus in our brain called the thalamus. So touch, sight, hearing, thalamus rewires that before it actually sends it out to the rest of the brain. But smell goes directly into the emotional brain. So that's why I try and tell people, get a smell that you really like, lavender, chamomile, get an organic essential oil, carry it with you, you know, and when you're having a hard time, smell will actually bring, bring you back into sort of, it brings you back into your body, which brings you back into the present moment. And anxiety is always about the future. So if right. you can bring yourself into your body, you're into the present moment and you've pulled yourself away from that future prediction and the horrible, you know, warnings, what ifs, worst case scenarios that your mind is using to try and make sense of how you feel. That's all you're doing is your, your mind is trying to make sense of how you feel, but it takes you down the wrong path. So you have to just sort of steer yourself onto the right path. And that's really how you heal anxiety. So I just want to add in there, like, so because I hear a lot of like tips on Instagram and whatever. And I think, okay, it's, it's not the, the um, essence that heals the anxiety. It's what brings you into awareness so that you can say, oh, hang on. I've lost my mind. I'm, yeah. I'm really anxious. Oh, let me do that breathing. Let me put my hand on my chest. Let me see if I can slow down for a second. And then that's the awareness where and then the compassion and then the SES can come back online right yeah. because then you can say oh I'm in a really tough place I'm going to call a friend yeah or I'm going to write about I'm going to do something I'm going to connect with somebody or because connection is so important sure but shame stops the connection so I think it's if anyone if you're listening you can come back and rewind it this part right here is really important because the tools are really helpful but it's no it's bringing yourself back to awareness so that that's what that is doing. So that's bringing yourself back to the point where you can just go, oh, I'm really anxious. Oh, okay. Let me, yeah. let me check in with myself. And the hardest part of that, Sam, is the fact that the part of your brain that would actually allow you to see that you're anxious has been shut off. Exactly. Right. So that's what makes anxiety such a self-reinforcing cycle. So that's mm -hmm. why awareness brings you back into that prefrontal cortex and allows you to sort of take control over the situation. Otherwise, it just becomes a runaway train. And unfortunately, we're wired to not see this, the solution when we're in anxiety. Right. Unfortunately. So you're you have you do with your ABCs, you do have a D, which is discipline. Yeah. And because your ego and then E is ego because your ego will always will always track you back to what's familiar and what we were talking about earlier on. So if you had chaos in childhood, 
when you get stressed, you will gravitate towards creating more chaos right. in your adulthood because that's <laughs> what was normal for you. And, it, and that's the cycle that there's so many cycles that just feed on themselves. And it's just being aware that, okay, I'm in this cycle. Um, what could I do to get out of it? And bringing yourself back into connection with your body is the first step for all of them, because then you can start seeing the other solutions. Because when you're in anxiety and you're in, in survival physiology, you shut off the part of your brain that would actually help you. That's awesome. That's perfect. Thank you so much. This you're welcome. Great. And Leslie had one question there, but could oh, it go the other way? High blood pressure. I mean, chronically, yeah, it'll create high blood pressure, but high blood pressure won't make you pass out. Only low blood blood pressure will do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Russ. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we're so happy you're here. Uh, we're going to give 20 books, uh, 20 of Russ's books away to the first people who signed up. So I'll be emailing you and we'll get that information from you. Um, and as a reminder, we're here. You're not alone. And yeah. um, we are here for you. And Thank you, Dr. Russ, for traveling on this little part of our journey with us. This was a great discussion. So many nuggets. Yeah. And you can find me uh, on Instagram oh, yeah. at the, ang the anxiety MD. That's the best way to find me. I, yeah. Right now I'm suspended for violating some unknown. I don't, I have no idea what I've done, but I uh, wondered, I looked yeah. for you the other day and I, I was know. like, what? is it i know it's this I like it's me it. like i'm not political i'm not sexual like it's not like i don't like okay. i'm looking at it like why did and it's been like a week almost now oh so so okay. yeah You're so coming back. i often answer people's you know direct questions or dms or whatever Amazing. i'm still not too big that i can't answer your question so at the anxiety md it's also my website the anxiety md so all my stuff is the anxiety md not the anxiety doctor but the anxiety md if you find that's an easy way to find me okay. thanks again sam i appreciate it so oh much. no thank you so much appreciate you bye everyone see ya see ya bye